reason or another, we we were just very blessed um, to be in that position and, and, and really to do it for the whole LGBTQ community. We now yes. call each other wife. One of my favorite things every day, Siri, text my wife that I'm on my way home. The last time uh, we got married because there was, <laughs> okay, so there was. Who gets to marry their loved one over again and over and again. again? I think it was like we got a text from Deb from the county clerk. Uh, we're opening up for marriage in Denver. Do you want to come down? And we're like, yes, we drop everything. And we learned a lot that it's, you know, it's very political, uh, but I don't think these elected officials always think about the people's lives that they're playing with. Uh, there were definitely high highs when, when it passed and low lows every time it was defeated. The Equality Act, um, that would provide uh, consistent protections ac across the states at a federal level uh, for non-discrimination and employment, housing, public accommodations. Well, there's a lot of legislators that have uh, signed on to it, but um, it, you know, it hasn't passed at this point. It happens all the time that people lose their job, lose their housing because of being um, queer. You could be married on the weekend and be fired from your job on Monday when you post a picture of your wedding. And we're very fortunate here in Colorado, Colorado. that we have these supportive laws, uh, but in other states that's not the case. We have been together 18 years now, right honey? Yes, 18 years. <laughs> and our son uh, will be 14 in July. And, uh, you know, life is good. Um, I mean, we're continuing to fight for when we see injustices. That's just part of who we are and our Jewish values. And we will continue to do that. Yeah, there's a saying in Hebrew, tikkun olam, which means to repair the world. And that is our obligation to contribute to tikkun olam. We're very blessed with where we're at. We're, we're very grateful that we've been able to do what we've been able to do in the fight for marriage equality, and the fight is not over. Get ready, Denver. It's almost time to vote. For our mayor, city council, clerk and recorder, auditor, and more, drop off your ballot or be in line to vote by 7 p.m. on Tuesday, April 4th. And be ready when it's time to vote. of this session of the Land Use, Transportation, and Infrastructure Committee begins now.
Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Councilman Amanda Sandoval, and I'm the chair of Ludi's. Um, let's go with start with introductions with online. Good morning, Candy Sedevaca, District 9. And then in chambers. Jamie Torres, District 3. Uh, good morning, Paul Cashman, South Denver, District 6. Thank you. Up first, we have CPD with the rezoning. Um, and I think it's Tony Latuga. Go ahead, Tony, and please introduce yourself for the record. Yeah, hi. Good morning. My name is Tony Lechuga. Um, I work for Community Planning and Development, and I'll be presenting this proposed uh, change to the zoning classification at 750 East 9th Avenue. Um, so this is an applicant-driven rezoning uh, seeking to change the, the zoning classification from PUD 499 to GMU3. Um, and just to get us oriented a little bit, um, so this property is in Council District 10, represented by Council Member Hines. It's located in the Capitol Hill neighborhood. And more specifically, the property is approximately 6,250 square feet, um, located at the southwest corner of East 9th Avenue and Clarkson Street. Um, and the applicant is requesting to rezone their property, like I said, from PUD 499, which was established um, in, I believe, 2001 to GMU3, which is general urban, multi-unit, up to three stories. Um, and this would allow a variety of residential building forms with a maximum building height between 30 and 40 feet. <clears throat> this map shows the existing zoning. Um, you can see it's a former chapter 59 PUD, which allows for the existing two-story structure up to 35 feet in height and used specifically as a, as a clinic for holistic naturopathic practitioners. So this is a very specifically designed PUD for this building and this limited use. Uh, this map shows the existing land use in the area of the surrounding blocks. You'll notice the subject site is an office building, as are a few other properties in the area. But most of the area is actually a mix of multi-unit and single-unit residential properties. Uh, this slide shows the existing context of the surrounding area um, from the street view. Uh, the subject property you can see in the top right. Um, the other photos show the form and scale of surrounding buildings, um, including the photo on the bottom left, which is a landmark structure, um, which the subject property was modeled after um, to retain the sort of neighborhood character. Uh, so switching to terms of process. so. Uh, the postcard notifying property owners with 200 feet was sent out on November 29th, um, letting them know that a rezoning was underway. And then on February 15th, planning board voted to recommend approval of the application. To date, staff has received one public comment in support of this rezoning from uh, an, an RNO that noted the need for more housing citywide. Uh, and staff has also received nine letters of opposition, all from either practitioners or from <coughs> patients who utilize the existing building, noting the importance of it to their practice or their, their, uh, their health. All right, uh, switching to the actual review criteria. So I'll remind everyone watching that there are five review criteria that were mandated to analyze to determine if a rezoning is appropriate. Um, and I'll go through all five of those now. Um, the first of which is consistency with adopted plans. Uh, for this particular application, there are three adopted plans that are applicable. Um, two are the citywide plans, Comprehensive Plan 2040 and Blueprint Denver. And then there is the East Central Area Plan, which was passed in 2020. So going through each of those plans now, um, we can see that the proposed rezoning meets some of the goals of the comprehensive plan, um, including these two, creating a greater mix of housing options in every neighborhood, as well as ensuring neighborhoods offer a mix of housing types and services for a diverse population. Turning now to Blueprint, which gets more specific into actual land uses. Um, the future neighborhood context is general urban, which is described as predominantly multi-unit with one and two unit mix, mixed use embedded. The future place type is high residential, which again is described as predominantly multi-unit residential with compatible commercial uses interspersed. And in terms of street types, 9th Avenue is a local street, which are predominantly characterized by residential uses. Um, in terms of the blueprint growth area strategy, this is considered all other areas of the city where we expect predominantly housing growth, including 20% of new housing 
by 2040. Um, with all of this, we, we believe that the GMU3 is appropriate to the Blueprint guidance. Um, I'll also note that Blueprint has specific policy recommendations, and I've highlighted two here, um, which point towards making an effort, effort to rezone properties from former Chapter 59 into the Denver Zoning Code, which this would do, and uh, to limit PUDs to unique and extraordinary circumstances, which we would no longer see this property as, um, as meeting the, the, the threshold of uh, unique and extraordinary circumstances. Uh, now we'll turn our attention to the, uh, the small area plan, the east area plan of 2020. I'm sorry, east central area plan of 2020. Um, so we see that in many ways it mirrors Blueprint Denver's recommendations. It calls for this to be general urban as well as high residential. The small area plan also includes more specific guidance on building heights. And for this property, it actually recommends buildings up to five stories. So staff finds again that the proposed GMU3 aligns with the guidance set forth in all three of these plans. Uh, staff also finds that the requested zoning meets the next two criteria. So the rezoning will necessarily result in uniformity of district regulations, um, and it will further public health, safety, and welfare by implementing our plan guidance and allowing for a broader range of residential uses on this site. Uh, staff finds there is justifying circumstance for this map amendment. Uh, the property retains its former Chapter 59 zoning and is seeking a standard zone district within the Denver Zoning Code. Uh, it's also implementing our plan guidance to, uh, to zone this as residential. Uh, and then finally, the proposed zoning is consistent with the neighborhood context, the multi-use districts, and specifically the GMU3 zone district intent statement. Therefore, based on the criteria, staff recommends uh, that this committee advance this to a full council hearing. And I'm happy to answer any questions. The applicant team is here as well to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Tony. <clears throat> First up in the queue, we have President Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Tony. Th these might be um, more questions for the applicant and kind of why they're seeking to come out from under the PUD. If they're here, are they online or in person? Okay. Hi, if you could introduce yourself. Uh, Max Odom from RCG. Okay, um, so just curious, um, uh, reading the letters of opposition, it sounds like how many businesses are in the building now? I believe there's 18 small offices. I don't know if they share um, offices, so I'd say up to 18. Okay, and the plan would be to replace offices with residential units? The initial plan is to just change the zoning to allow for future residential. Obviously, some of the tenants have leases in place. Those have to be honored. Um, and we're acquiring the building. We're not the current owners of the building. Oh, okay. Just, just to stay. Are, are there any plans to demo the building? Oh, we would not demo the building. We want to keep it as is. We might have to make some minor modifications to the windows um, on the outside, but we would do that within the spirit of the architecture of the building now. Does the ME3 give you any additional height over what it currently is right now? Would you? would give us the uh, opportunity to go an additional story. One story more. Yeah, but uh, it would, number one, it would be cost effective, and number two, it would not look like the building it is now. Okay. We, we want to keep the building as is. We wouldn't touch that at all. Okay. Um, let me see. I didn't, apart from the um, one RNO, were there other letters of support? Um, not to the best of my knowledge. We sent it to all three of the RNOs, um, but I believe only one sent back in. So is there an RNO that actually meets for that neighborhood? Like has that? A, that actually meets, like has a public meeting and neighbor membership? Um, for the RNOs? Yeah. I'm not sure. We offered to go and speak to all the RNOs, um, but none of them got back to us on that option. Okay. And you met with the councilman for the area? Yes, Councilman Hines. Okay. Um, okay, no more questions, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Tony, I have a question for you. You briefly talked about the PUD, but can you go, go over the PUD a little bit more? Yeah, so um, so the PUD is, is uh, sort of more thoroughly described in the staff report, but it was adopted in 2000. Um, so it was intended to allow the construction of, of a two-story clinic 
very specific to, to these uses. Um, it was modeled after the Kistler Rodriguez house, which is that building right next door. Um, they had joint ownership at the time, and so um, they wanted to model the building after the existing historic structure. So a lot of the design uh, requirements built into the PUD sort of call for that specific building to look that way. Um, so uh, the PUD does allow a maximum height of 35 feet, even though it's only a two-story building. So the, the new zoning would allow you know, 35 to 40 feet. So it does kind of allow for that extra story, but it's kind of within the same height range as the PUD now. Um, and it has, the PUD has very specific details about building separation, landscaping, um, sort of other design requirements. Um, and then, as I said, it limits the use of the structure to uh, specifically holistic naturopathic practitioners. Um, so a very specific use. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a app question for the applicant. Is the site currently 100% um, leased right now? Do you have openings? Um, to the best of our knowledge, on the last rent roll, it was 95% occupied. I'm sorry, can you speak up a little bit? Um, to the best of our knowledge, on the last rent roll we received from the owner, it was 95% occupied. And so you're not the owner? No, we're, the, we're under agreement to purchase the building. So you're, if this rezoning fails, will you continue to purchase this building? Um, we will not, know. So your purchase is contingent upon the rezoning of this building? Correct. To housing? What, or what, what's your performer like? What kind of developer are you? We do office, neighborhood retail, multifamily. Um, we kind of do it all. So, no, go ahead. And when you picked the zone district, why did you pick this specific zone district? What was, what was your, the thought process behind this zone district? Picking the site specifically or just the zoning that we're going The through. zoning. Um, we had talked to the planning board, had a pre-application, or not the planning board, sorry, the planning department, um, and asked them what the most appropriate zoning was. And it was GMU, either three or five. Um, we initially applied for five. Um, the staff came back and recommended that we do a three, which is fine because we weren't going to touch the building anyway. Um, so, and then all the surround, I shouldn't say all the surrounding uses, but a lot of the surrounding uses are some form of GMU. Um, and okay. that's why we chose that. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other questions, um, on this one, I'd like to do a roll call, Luke. Do we have a motion and a second? We have a motion by President Torres, second by Councilman Cashman. And can you do a roll call, Luke? Sidabaka? Aye. Cashman? Aye. Torres? Aye. Sandoval? No. One nay, three ayes. The motion passed. Yeah. Motion passes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. We'll see you in front of City Council. Next up, we have um, Cortland. You okay, Cortland? <laughs> <laughs> Making an entrance to the West Area Plan. <laughs> You've come this far, Cortland. You don't know yet. <laughs> Just go ahead and introduce yourself and then take it away. All right, thank you. Um, my name is Cortland Heiser. I'm the Neighborhood um, Planning Supervisor with Community Planning and Development. I'm here today uh, with Chelsea Benuna, a member of the project team. I'll be delivering the presentation, and then um, Chelsea will be available to help answer questions. Uh, so there's two main topics um, that I want to cover at today's presentation. Uh, the first is a quick overview of what's in the plan, uh, and then we'll move on to the review criteria that City Council considers um, when a plan's up for adoption. So first topic, uh, plan overview, uh, structure and content of the West Area Plan. So uh, West Area Plan is part of the Neighborhood Planning Initiative, uh, our program to cover the entire city with neighborhood plans. Uh, the West Planning Area uh, covers six neighborhoods, Barnum, Barnum West, Valverde, Villa Park, Sun Valley, and West Colfax. Uh, this graphic summarizes the structure of the plan. You could think of it as sort of a visual uh, table of contents. Uh, all the content um, that you would expect to find in an NPI area plan is here. 
um, including the core topics that overlap um, with Blueprint Denver and the comp plan addressing quality of life, mobility, land use and built form, uh, and economy and housing. Uh, this is really the middle framework of the plan uh, and these recommendations and these four sections I just identified that are shown here in the red box, they apply area wide. Um, but in addition to that, we have more specific guidance for small areas um, that are listed below the red box that include uh, more specific geographies. So transformative project recommendations, neighborhood specific chapters, which have neighborhood specific recommendations that just apply to that neighborhood, and then an implementation section um, that covers it all. Listed on the left of the graphic, you see quality of life lens um, cross-cutting uh, through all chapters. This was in response to community feedback that we heard throughout the planning process and specifically input from our steering committee that said quality of life is the most important thing. It needs to be the driver for all other topics uh, because everything affects quality of life. And so to acknowledge that, um, we applied that lens to all the chapters and you find quality of life in its own section, but also incorporated into other plan sections. Um, so this shows uh, a few examples of how that was accomplished. So quality of life in the mobility section, um, this is just one example, there are many others we could highlight, but reducing transportation um, pollution uh, as being an improvement to quality of life. In economy, uh, we highlight Denver's green workforce development strategy, uh, in land use, uh, Denver's Green Building Ordinance, and there are many other examples. The West Area Plan is uh, the first MPI plan to specifically have a section um, addressing uh, the role of water uh, within the plan area. The water section builds on Denver's One Water Plan, uh, and it shows how information about floodplains, topography, um, impervious services, water quality, and similar topics um, how they affect the West area, and it provides recommendations on how to uh, best manage uh, development and water quality locally. This is also the first MPI plan to have a section um, specific to uh, addressing historic and present inequities. Um, this is something that has been built into a neighbor planning initiative through Blueprint Denver, which has an equity index, and usually the way um, that we approach this is that we look at the equity index, how it affects, as identified by Blueprint Denver, how it affects an area that we're working in. And it's really treated as an existing condition and then we have recommendations that move forward. And what's different about how we've approached it here in the West Area Plan is that we're also looking backwards, um, back in time to historical root causes that resulted in the present day inequities and then uh, providing the strategies um, looking forward. So it's a more complete view and approach uh, for addressing um, equity within the community. One of the features of this section is a historical timeline. Um, it highlights not just inequities, but some of the successes over time within the community as well. Um, and uh, this is where you'll find the specific identification of some of the, the root causes uh, of present day inequities that the plan strives to address. So as a few examples of that, historical redlining uh, helped to inform ownership, home ownership and affordability recommendations that are contained within the plan. The area's industrial history um, helped to inform uh, recommendations related to pollution or environmental quality. And uh, the disconnection of the mobility network, both some of being natural, but also man-made. So the South Platte River, um, Sixth Ave uh, being introduced through the community. Um, the mobility chapter helps to address connectivity and improve it for uh, all modes. So that was the quick overview of what's in the plan and also what's new or innovative about it compared to other MPI plans. And for the remainder of the presentation, I'll focus on the review criteria uh, that City Council will use uh, to evaluate the plan. Before I get into that, uh, I just want to mention that Planning Board held their public hearing uh, on the West Area Plan a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we had 12 speakers at the public hearing, uh, and the Planning Board voted to approve the plan by a vote of nine in favor and zero against. Planning Board uses the same three criteria to evaluate plans that City Council uses. Uh, those criteria are an inclusive community process, uh, consistency with the comprehensive plan, 
and uh, that the plan demonstrates a long-term view. So we'll go through each of those individually. And this, what I'll present now is a summary of more detailed information uh, that you'll find in, in the staff report. So the West Area planning process, uh, this plan was in process for a long time. Uh, it kicked off in the fall of 2019, and we're only just wrapping it up now, so about three and a half years from start to finish uh, for this planning process. Uh, one of the things that slowed it down, um, which would be true of any city project uh, that's been in process uh, for this amount of time, was the pandemic and shutdowns and restrictions on gathering. Uh, that happened in the middle of our planning process for the middle two years uh, of the West Area Plan, and we had to pivot and adjust uh, to online and virtual, um, as everyone did. But of course, it has a disproportionate impact on a process like this, where so much of the input is collected uh, in person. This slide summarizes the main components of the community engagement um, that was conducted over that three-year period. Uh, these are the main categories of things that were done uh, for outreach and engagement. So first, uh, workshops and online events. And so this includes both uh, conventional in-person uh, public meetings, of which we had three for this process, two at the beginning before the pandemic, uh, and then another community-wide in-person event uh, this past fall to review the draft plan. In between, we tried a few different things. Uh, we had uh, online self-directed open house uh, to inform um, uh, draft recommendations, uh, and that was accompanied by um, some robust online surveys. Um, we could say that it's a survey, but really for that we had four surveys, each exploring different topics in detail. Um, we did a webinar, um, and uh, we did rely on online surveys uh, quite a bit as part of this planning process to collect uh, public input, some of which would have uh, normally been done in person. We also had two public review drafts. Um, that uh, the public could di comment directly on using the city's Conveyo tool um, to not just submit comments, but then other reviewers can see what other people are saying about the plan. We had two review drafts for that. Uh, relied quite heavily on attending uh, community meetings, um, which included uh, outdoor community events uh, during the height of the, the pandemic when we couldn't gather indoors, and also appearing at uh, many community organizations and registered neighborhood organization meetings um, to piggyback on meetings that were already happening in the community. We offered, offered uh, office hours at strategic points in the planning process, especially when we had drafts out um, to help answer questions um, and collect feedback from people. Uh, in total, 35 uh, office hour sessions. Uh, and then a, a really dedicated steering committee that met approximately monthly throughout the planning process, 36 meetings uh, over uh, the three-year planning period, as well as uh, eight what we called working group meetings over the past summer. Uh, after we released that first public review draft, steering committee formed a subgroup that met weekly all summer uh, for eight, eight weeks in a row to provide detailed input uh, on the draft document that helped inform a revised draft that was released in the fall. Uh, these, uh, this slide here highlights um, comments, uh, statistics on the draft plans themselves. So the first draft uh, that came out last spring was open through the summer, uh, almost until we released an updated draft um, uh, getting uh, 368 comments and over a thousand views. And then draft two released just a couple of days ahead of Halloween uh, and left uh, open into early January, um, but accompanied by um, a big media push to generate more interest in it. Um, so open for a shorter period of time, but collecting uh, even, even more comments and a comparable number of page views. We also do uh, a robust communications push uh, for all of our engagement efforts and efforts, and some of those uh, statistics are highlighted here. So we do uh, emails in a newsletter type format. We had over 1,300 subscribers to our email list uh, for this planning process. Uh, sent out 24 of those, uh, usually advertising opportunities to engage in the process or come to public meetings. Reach uh, refers to the number of people who actually opened an email or saw a social media post. Um, and the statistics that are presented here for social media uh, are specific to this area, um, within the West area. Uh, how many people who uh, reside in the area followed the, the plan, 
or saw the posts. Uh, and the numbers get into the tens of thousands here because of the three-year planning process and the large number of posts. There was also um, some media coverage. We had uh, stories in the Denver North Star and in the Denver Ag Blog. And this slide just highlights how we try to make all of our engagement inclusive and we incorporate um, certain types of things throughout our planning process. So we always provide Spanish language interpretation, food and childcare um, at our in-person workshops. Um, we create flyers, uh, both in English and Spanish. Uh, there was a really robust flyering uh, effort for uh, draft number one last spring, with over 9,000 flyers distributed uh, within the West area. All of our electronic communication is ADA accessible and viewable on uh, smartphones and tablets. And uh, by special request, we can accommodate uh, additional language services, translation, or print copies of materials. Uh, so the finding on criteria number one uh, is that the West Area Plan was developed through an inclusive community process. The second criteria is consistency with adopted plans. The main ones here being uh, Comprehensive Plan 2040 and Blueprint Denver. Uh, and this is summarized uh, on this slide here. We won't go through all of the points of consistency, but if you're curious, the staff report does detail uh, each goal and strategy uh, that the West Area Plan is consistent with for Comprehensive Plan 2040, uh, as well as Blueprint Denver. Um, and in both cases, we have dozens of policies and strategies uh, where the neighborhood plan is consistent. Uh, the plan also makes use of the same tools, um, planning tools that Blueprint Denver uses. Um, and by that, I mean specifically the mapping system that Blueprint Denver uses, uh, we also use um, in NPI area plans. And so neighborhood context, future places, the growth strategy map, these are things that Blueprint Denver developed and then we use in our neighborhood plans and annually uh, each spring there's a process to update Blueprint Denver um, to bring it into alignment with uh, adopted uh, neighborhood plans. And so uh, following adoption of this plan um, and on that cycle next year, Blueprint Denver itself will be updated so that it'll be fully consistent with what's recommended in the West Area Plan. And in this way, we keep uh, Blueprint itself more current and up to date as we do neighborhood plans. So uh, the finding for the second criteria is that the West Area Plan is consistent with Comp Plan 2040 and Blueprint. And then the third criteria is uh, long-term view. Uh, the West Area Plan uh, looks forward to a planning horizon of 2040. It establishes a vision for the community that addresses many of the core topics uh, that the Comp Plan and Blueprint themselves address. It has an aspirational vision uh, and an implementation strategy uh, that will take many years to achieve. And so the finding here is that the West Area Plan has an appropriate long-term perspective. Uh, staff recommends that uh, the Ludi Committee forward the West Area Plan for consideration by the full uh, Denver City Council, finding that all three criteria have been met. And this is my final slide. Um, it just details what the next steps will be if Ludi uh, moves his plan forward today. Uh, we'll be moving forward to the City Council uh, adoption process in March. Thank you, Cortland. And thank you um, to your staff and CPD's dedication to this process. First up in the queue, we have President Torres. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Cortland. Um, thank you, uh, all of CPD. Um, I don't have questions. I think um, if there were no other questions from my colleagues, I just wanted to um, uh, just give some commentary about um, what I think has been the really important outcomes of doing this plan and um, why it looks a little different than um, other plans that we've seen just in kind of some of the orientation, which was one of the engagement opportunities in, in um, being able to take a little bit of extra time, um, slow down some process and really orient around quality of life. And, um, and you'll notice that that is the first chapter of this uh, plan. It is also um, what everything centers back to and I really appreciate CPD um, doing that with a plan. We don't start with land use, we don't start with um, with mobility, we start with quality of life. And so um, that was something that uh, folks contributing to this plan 
um, really wanted emphasis on. So I appreciate that being reflected in this way. Um, engagement was also a significant piece. So thank you for um, the three slides that really highlight how deep um, and how available um, the various kind of phases of this plan have been, despite you know a good half of it at least being while we were under quarantine and um, not able to meet um, in in public. Um, we already know that oftentimes our engagement or even the planning initiatives themselves struggle to reach communities of color, um, families um, with multiple jobs, working families. Um, so I just want to um, raise up that we partnered intentionally with Colorado Jobs with Justice, um, CPD, my office, Councilwoman Sandoval's office, Councilman Clark's office, um, uh, to make sure that we were really able to reach into community and gather input to um, really help inform what were the priorities that neighbors wanted. Um, and we weren't just waiting for folks to be online to fill out surveys. These were, these were in-person opportunities to meet with folks that um, often we miss um, in doing some of these outreach events. So I um, just want to say that and, and, and just how proud I am of my community um, in staying so engaged for three and a half years through this and um, uh, really making sure that it became something that they could also be proud of. So um, thanks to C CPD. Thank you to my council colleagues um, uh, who also have territory in this, Councilwoman Sandoval and Councilman Clark, um, and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you. Thank you, President Torres. Um, thank you to CPD and the residents of the West Side who worked on this plan. Um, it started, we had this amazing kickoff at Lake and then unbeknownst to all of us, we had a worldwide pandemic. And I think that um, in my personal opinion, planning has taken, it's taken a toll on all of us, but it's also this pandemic has taken a toll on planning, having, um, I am a type of person who has side conversations with people to get to know them. And in these situations, you can't. You're sitting at home, looking at a plan, not really able to talk to somebody else and say, hey, what does this mean? How does this look? What's the unintended consequences of this plan? And so you all stopped, slowed down and um, gave it more time. And I, I'm really appreciative of the work that you did for the river. I don't remember a neighborhood plan looking at the river and having an eye at the river prior. Um, and I've done a neighborhood plan in Globeville. We didn't do that when we were neighborhood planning in 2015. So there are different things that have come out of these neighborhood planning processes and I'm thankful for them advancing. I'm thankful for the partnership with President Torres and Councilman Clark and all of the residents in West Colfax who I get to represent. Um, seeing no other questions or comments in the queue, we have a motion to move this forward. It's been motioned by President Torres and seconded by myself. Any objections? Seeing none, we'll see you at City Council, Cortland. Thank you for everything. Seeing no, seeing no other um, agenda items before us, this committee stands adjourned and we will see you all next week. Thank you.